Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you've been well. We're here at my house. Uh, this is the main floor above me. We got decked a little bit, not quite all of it. And I'm here in the basement. End of a work day, so I'm pretty exhausted, but I figured I should film kind of the intro video to the homestead build. It's gonna be a long video. I'm probably gonna throw the camera on a tripod because my arm's gonna get too tired and talk for like an hour about everything that went into where I am now. So shopping for land, considerations for location, what I was looking for in land, then what I was looking for in the house, design considerations for the house, how it feels to be owner, builder, general contractor, having never really done this before. I'm gonna get into kind of every aspect of that. So it's gonna be a long talking video. It's gonna be long, so I'm gonna put chapters down here below. So in this little timestamp, if you don't know how it works, it's like sectioned off into little things. You can kind of hover over or click it or whatever. And if you're only interested in a specific thing, I'll try to break this video up. And then if you're like, I only really care about that, skip ahead, whatever. I don't care, hit that thumbs up button though and get subscribed if you are into this kind of content. So yeah, I'm already getting tired because it's been a long day. So I'm <laughs> gonna find a tripod set it down and we'll get into it. All right, so the plan, I filmed some of this already and my, my mic came unplugged and it was, it was horrible. So I'm starting over, uh, I'm not a very good YouTuber. So the plan, the plan, this is kind of the first section, I guess, the plan, you gotta make a plan. I, I wasn't born into wealth, my family doesn't have any money, we're very middle class, I, I don't have daddy's money, I didn't just on a whim say, I wanna buy a property and build a house. This has been about a decade long journey. I'm 37, I'm a lot older than a lot of people think. So a lot of people think I'm some 20 year old that just has all this money. Uh, no, it's been a long plan. So this this is the, the house I live in right now, just to, give some, just to give some random generic backstory. The house I live in now is the third house that I've owned, that I've purchased myself. The first house I purchased, I had, I was living in an apartment at the time with like four roommates and I was like, you know what, we're all paying rent. Why don't I just take all that rent money that my friends are making and pay off my mortgage with it? So I bought a house in my early 20s and lived with a bunch of friends for a while. Market went way up, sold that house for a profit, didn't buy a Lamborghini, saved it, bought a second house. Uh, and b even my first house, my second house, and my current house, I did a lot of home renovations. So I, I have a lot of experience in home renovations now at this point. And I have a tiny bit of construction experience. I worked construction just as a, just a framing monkey for a few summers during college. So that's kind of wh where I felt more comfortable handling home improvement tasks, which is kind of ultimately what led me to deciding to be a homeowner builder general contractor, which I'll get more into, I think probably at the end of the video. But anyway, bought the first house, fixed it up, sold it for a big profit, bought a second house, also fixed it up, market also went up, sold it for a profit, bought my third house, which I live in currently, that's the house that you see me in my driveway talking about my vehicles or whatever, uh, fixed that house up quite a bit and it also went up in value. So I've made profit now on three houses and instead of just spending all the money and going out on fancy lavish things and buying a bunch of cool stuff, I do have some cool stuff, but buying a bunch of really extravagant cool stuff, I didn't do it, I just saved money and invested it. So it's been about a decade's journey to get to to where I was finally in a position to buy land and build a custom home on because it's expensive. Uh, some places, you know, you live in states that nobody really wants to live in and it's way cheaper to do. In Colorado, it's not that cheap to do. Uh, in the future, depending on feedback I get in this video, maybe I'll talk about budgets, maybe I'll talk about that kind of stuff a little bit more. I'm not gonna get into it in this video because it's already gonna be so long. So long-term plan, my goal, Really, I used to live in the suburbs and realized I didn't like it. I'm kind of a bit of a prepper. Uh, if you watch a lot of my videos, you'll, you'll understand that. Not a crazy doomsday prepper, but I just wanna be more self-sufficient. And any good prepper, the end goal isn't to have 100,000 rounds of 5.56. Five, it's really to be more self-sufficient and uh, to not rely on the government or the grocery store or the grid. So my end goal has always been to be more self-sufficient on a property that at least has the potential to be on grid. I'm not gonna get into it too much, or off grid. I'm not gonna get too much into this video. My house will be on grid, 
but I'm planning to have solar, battery backup, everything. It's on a well and its own septic system, so I will have the ability to flip a switch, flip a switch, and then go off grid. So when the power goes out, I will continue functioning. I'll probably get more into that as this series develops, talking about what I've built into my home to kind of make it better for self-reliance. So anyway, 10 year goal, be more self-reliant, eventually buy some land, build a custom home. So I'm finally here achieving that long-term goal of mine. Just so you know, I wasn't just like, hey, let's build a house, it sounds fun. Uh, because it's a lot of planning and a lot of work. So that's kind of a little bit of the backstory of how we got here to buying land and the property and the location. And I think I'm gonna kind of skip into the next section here because I'm kind of talking about land. So selection of location. Location, location, location. That's so annoying when people say that, but location is super important. I, I switched my camera actually so you could see a little bit more of the location. Here we are, massive pine trees. We are in Colorado. Kind of a joke on my channel. Oh, I live in the mountains of Colorado. So some people have asked me, are you still living in the mountains of Colorado? I am, but kind of interestingly enough, I'm closer to town now and lower in elevation. And I'll talk about the reasons why. I made that decision, but also on more land. Another question I get asked a lot is how many acres did you get? I'm on 15 acres, which is a good number. I'd, I'd love 100 acres or 200 or 1,000, but 15 acres is enough land to have some fun with. Uh, and it's really hard to find undeveloped 15 acres that is super commutable to Denver and the airport, but you're still kind of in rural America. So all that aside, location, choosing a location. So. I'll kind of start at a very broad view. Again, most of this video is gonna be applied directly to me, what goes into my thought process. Yours may be different. Maybe you are a diehard surfer. If you can't surf, your life will fall apart. Obviously, living in Colorado isn't the place for you. But for me, Colorado is super sweet. I moved out here, uh, I think 13 or 14 years ago now, after college. I'm 37 years old. A lot of people think I'm just some young punk 20 year old with daddy's money. Not the case at all. I just talked about that, uh, kind of how I got here. I just got those good Asian genes that I look like a baby still, and I can't grow a beard really, so that probably comes into play. But I've lived out in Colorado for a while. Uh, my older brother actually lived out in Colorado. That's the reason I came to Colorado after college. So he's kind of to thank for that. And then my parents followed. And so my parents live here. So family, my family, all of my near family, I have one brother and my parents, and they live in Colorado, aunts and uncles and stuff. I'm not that close with, honestly. Uh, but my main family live in Colorado. And that's what's important to me, being near family. All, pretty much, pretty much all of my close college buddies also came out to Colorado when I came out. So I have a big friend group here. I've made new friends in Colorado as well. And then even some internet friend like Talon, you guys have seen him in a ton of my videos. He moved out and lives in Colorado now, not because of me, but I'm sure I played a tiny little bit of, you know, some role in that. And I basically just want all my friends to live in Colorado because I love this state. I'm gonna take a very, very, very tiny little tangent here because I do get this question a lot as well. And that's, Mike, you're such a Second Amendment supporter. Why would you live in that state that has horrible gun laws? Uh, it's true, I am a big Second Amendment supporter. I, I own a holster company. I try to be actively involved in politics and donate my money to organizations that are fighting for our rights. So this is an important thing and I'm not gonna get deep on it, but just to, just to kind of answer your question, I am hardcore against running from a fight. Uh, a lot of people, especially in the Second Amendment community, have this weird, screwed up thinking of, hey, the, the gun laws in my state are kind of turning bad. Let me run away from it and go to a state that has more favorable gun laws. What happens with that is then those gun laws become more and more stringent because everyone's moved away from the state. And that state is never gonna go back to a state that you wanna live in. And then that'll just spread and spread and spread. And then there will be one last little bastion of gun rights or something. So don't run. If anything, become more active and more uh, kind of involved in, in local politics if you feel that way. So that is, that is a quick short answer to why do you live in Colorado even though the gun laws aren't great. The gun laws aren't great, but they're definitely in the upper 50 percentile of states gun laws and then also once you get out in rural Colorado it is 
it's much different than like living in Denver or Boulder, I think. So Colorado, other reasons to live in Colorado. This is not a sales pitch for Colorado. I'm just, again, talking about why I chose here rather than somewhere else. Ashley as well, my wife, most of her family and friends live here as well. She has a daughter who is my stepdaughter and then her, so my stepdaughter's dad lives here as well. So logistically, it just makes sense to live here. Uh, now, when it comes to preparedness, it makes a lot of sense to live in Colorado. Colorado is a bastion. Colorado is one of the best survival locations known to man because we don't get hurricanes. We don't get earthquakes. In true Colorado, about half the state of Colorado, I just refer to as Kansas. It's just the flats. There's some tornadoes and stuff out there, but in true Colorado, once you get into the mountains, you don't have to deal with tornadoes either. We could get affected by a mega super volcano or something like that, but the only real natural thing that I have to worry about here, uh, again, being outside of Denver, is blizzards. Uh, now, I've lived in the mountains now for I think seven or eight years, roughly, uh, and at higher elevation than I am now. And I think the longest my power has ever been out is like one, maybe two days. Now, in my current house, I do have a couple Tesla power walls and solar, so my power actually never goes out, uh, which is what I'm planning for this house, though different technologies than I have there. But so living in the mountains of Colorado, not even just Denver, in the mountains of Colorado, I think I've only had one to two days of power outage. Uh, and then I have crazy vehicles, obviously, so I'm never actually stuck. I can always get out. Now, if I had a little two-wheel drive car, some blizzards have happened and I'd probably be kind of stuck in, in my house for a few days until all the roads were plowed and dried up and everything like that. So, we really only gotta deal with snow. And even snow is super easy to survive if you have a means to heat your home and you have food. Yeah, I could survive a 100-foot blizzard in my home, I mean 100 foot, not really, because that would like cover everything up, but I could survive a 10 foot blizzard, no problem, and most people can too. If you just have a couple weeks of food, you can survive anything in Colorado. And then the other reason I love Colorado is sunshine, sun. I love the sun, I love that vitamin D, I love the feel of the sun on my skin. So, I wouldn't be able to live in a super gloomy state or location that rains a lot and is overcast. I love the sun. Uh, and Colorado is pretty mild. The winters are not too bad. The summers are not too bad, but we do get seasons. I love wearing flannels. I've talked about that in other videos, so you know all that. So for a specific location, now I've kind of talked about broad, general locations, why I chose where I, where I chose, and again, it'll be different for you. And sorry, I know a lot of this video is going to be rambling. It's going to be a long video. It's just podcast style. Hopefully you're not even watching this video because there's very little visual stimuli. So big picture location, friends, family, support network, great for survival, wonderful, lot of stuff to do, mountain biking, camping, hiking, trails. Uh, it just, we don't have an ocean. That's the, really the only thing we don't have, honestly. Other than that, we have everything. We got all the major sports leagues, even though I don't really care about that at all. Pretty good restaurants, a lot to do. Near an airport also, which is important. Uh, Denver International Airport, I can get a nonstop flight to almost everywhere. It's a major hub and I travel a fair bit for work. So that's super important as well. So location, specific location for me. Again, I've lived higher elevation. Currently I live at about 8,800 feet in Colorado and I get a lot of snow. I get a ton of snow. Where I live right now, the, you know, my neighbors and other people that live in the community and in, in, the, in the city, or actually really more specifically where I live, up high on the top of a named mountain, when there's a snow forecast, like it's gonna snow 10 to 20 inches. We're always getting 20 inches. And actually the joke is, uh, in, in my street, you can take the low projection and the high projection and then add them and then that's how much snow we're gonna get. So we have a ton of snow where I live. And again, I don't mind snow because there's so much sun, it melts off pretty quick if you have sunlight. So a quick story is if you're, if you're planning on living in a place that has snow and you're shopping for houses, maybe even just in a neighborhood, I used to live in a suburb, so I saw this firsthand. If your driveway has southern exposure, if it's facing south, you pretty much don't have to shovel your driveway or anything. The sun is gonna melt it in a day or a couple of days because again, Colorado is so sunny. If you have a northern facing driveway, this is south, so that's why I'm doing it. If you have a northern facing driveway, 
your house is casting a shadow on your driveway and therefore it will never melt, ever. And so if you don't shovel it right away and you drive on it, it'll turn to ice and it'll just be icy and messy and disgusting for the rest of the season, not really, but for at least a few days or a couple of weeks. Or if you're in, your mount if you're in the mountains, it will stay that way basically for the whole year until you salt it or something like that. So southern exposure, super important. And so when choosing a property, I wanted to get a little bit lower elevation primarily because I didn't want to deal with snow as much. And you also have a longer growing season. Again, with self-sufficiency, I want to be growing a lot more crops. I want to have an orchard, maybe a, maybe a vineyard, and just grow a lot of crops. Ashley's kind of getting more into gardening. We've been exper experimenting with it kind of up at our place just to see what works and what doesn't work. So we have a longer growing season down lower elevation. And this property specifically, I wanted more sun exposure. So when I come out and I was shopping for property, every time I went out, I had this app, Photo Pills. There's other apps like it, but it basically gives you augmented reality of the sun overlaid onto your phone screen camera. So I can go and see like, well, when the sun, maybe I can choose December and the sun is gonna be low, it's gonna be clearing that hill off in the distance and I'm gonna get a lot of sun exposure. Or potentially in the mountains, this happens a lot. You're like, oh man, well, there is a large hill right there and now I see that for four months out of the year that's gonna block half of my sun so sun exposure very important uh, and when you have the luxury I guess of kind of shopping for a property or even shopping for an existing house that is probably the most important feature for me to look at is will I get good sun exposure? Will I be able to orient my house in a way? I'll talk more about this in the house building section of this video, kind of like my design. I designed my own home with a lot of these principles. So will the property, will where I want to hang out and work, will my yard, will my driveway and the house itself get good sun exposure all year round? So this here is the front of my house. In the summer, the sun basically goes like that. And then in the winter, you can see that yellow line there. So basically it'll rise right there, set right over there. So I have sun streaming in these windows. This is the front of my house, the south side of my house basically the entire day. Now, in a perfect world, in the summer when it's hot and you don't want the sun beating in, you can orient your house or maybe there's trees or natural elements that will block some of the sun during the hot months. So you gotta take this into consideration when shopping for property, especially in places that get cold. Uh, you don't need to, you know, you can just burn a fire all day or run your heat all day and just live inside. But for me, I like being outside again because Colorado has relatively mild winters. So if I can be outside in the winter in the sun, it is not uncommon for me to sit on my porch with shorts and no shirt and just soak up that vitamin D on Christmas. It's cool. Uh, but you have to be able to have, you have to be able to situate everything that you want where it can get sun exposure. And then depending on what you want to do, my property relatively flat, if I get cattle or horses or goats or whatever, we're gonna have chickens and goats. It's kind of the initial plan and see how that goes. We have chickens right now, no goats. So we're gonna dip our feet into like the kind of homesteading thing by continuing to have chickens and then get goats and milk the goats. And that's kind of the first little step and see how that goes and maybe we'll get more animals from there. But the property right now, I'm on 15 acres, has room for grazing animals, has room to plant orchards and crops and gets good, great sun exposure. Uh, also something to consider, this is harder to find. I was lucky, I have, it's, it's a seasonal creek technically. It's not a named creek, you won't find it on a map, nothing like that. But there's a creek that has water in it almost all year round. And that is cool because I will have access to the creek all year round. Now with with roof and gutter and rain collection, it rains enough in Colorado where if I have enough water storage, technically I could have water forever. I also have a well, uh, that is what feeds water into my house. So theoretically I'll always have water, but it's nice having a little bit of water uh, on hand as well. Animals like water, so if you need to hunt 
end of the world. You animals come down and they drink there as well. Actually, I've seen bear on my property and deer and elk and all kinds of stuff. So that's cool. And then, so that's the front of my house, south. This is the back of my house, north. So I'll have a deck out here, a covered deck, so I won't have to shovel it ever. And then down there is my little creek. Maybe I'll build a pond one day. And then kind of back in the trees here. So water, yeah, and then, you know, depending on your situation, maybe that's a lake, maybe I can't actually fish in this thing, so that's kind of a bummer, but maybe you want to have a lake house or a beach house or whatever. So those things are kind of important for preparedness and kind of important for what went into my decision for buying land. <sighs> so now we'll talk about actual house design considerations. A little backstory. I have no history in construction. I'm not a builder. I'm not a licensed general contractor. Technically, I am the general contractor on my own house. I'll kind of talk about that whole experience a little bit later in the video, I think, if I have the energy for it. But I, I'm not a professional. I'm not trying to act like I know everything. I don't. I've watched a lot of YouTube. I've talked to some industry experts. I've I've read a lot of articles, so I, I try, I've tried to get pretty good, a, a, a large swash of knowledge to pull from when designing my own house. So I designed this house, uh, and I didn't really start designing a house until I bought the land, because you really kind of have to design the house around the land. Uh, some features, slope, elevation, whatever, where the sun is, all that stuff kind of goes into how you're going to design the house. So I just found some program online. It was actually an in-browser app. It doesn't even exist anymore. I don't remember. I, I don't remember what it was, but I bookmarked it and now it doesn't work. But my original design, I just found something online, but I kind of just drew some walls and rooms and layouts. And when designing my house, there's some people know of houses called like earth ships and those are more in in hot climates but they're basically built into the ground sun exposure in the winter and the idea is to use the sun's energy to kind of heat your home when it's cold and then you're shading your home and then you're using the earth's mass the constant temperature of the earth in colorado the earth six feet down or eight feet i don't know exactly but the earth itself maintains a constant temperature throughout the year, dead of winter, heat of summer. When you go down far enough into the earth, not that far, it is 55 degrees, give or take five degrees. And that concept helps you maintain a level, comfortable living environment without using as much energy. So I didn't build an earth ship, but I took some of these principles and it's called passive solar or there's a lot of different names for it but essentially it's using the heat of the sun and really the angle of the sun in the winter in the winter the sun is lower it's you don't have as long of days and it can shoot into the windows that are facing south better so i designed the, the house with a lot of windows maybe i'll show some renders up here with a lot of windows on the south side also with a sun with a single slope it's called a shed style roof that basically wedges out to catch all of that sunlight. So I have big, tall windows, and it's angled to the sun comes in and basically hits the back wall of my house. So I have a long east to west house, and it's not very deep north to south. And building a true, true, like, if I followed all the concepts and all the principles, I'd basically have no windows on the north side of my house because they just lose energy and it's massively insulated and all this kind of stuff. I want to live in my house. Again, Colorado is relatively mild. I'm not building a house that has to survive Antarctica temperatures or something like that. So I took some of the principles, sun, mostly because I just love the feeling of the sun on my body. I think my house is actually going to be too hot without running the heater ever in the summer I think it's get or in the winters I think it's going to be too hot because there are so many windows and there's going to be so much sun baking me that I think I'll spend a good amount of the summer literally or the winter sorry I'm tired spend a good amount of the winter with the windows open probably because it's going to be too hot don't don't hold me to that we'll see once the house is actually built but want a lot of sun long skinny house so that way you can soak in your the, the bulk of your house can soak in a bunch of sun's heat 
Then you want overhangs. Now I sh probably should have went further, bigger, longer overhangs because for half of the year, basically, you don't want that sun heating your house because then you have to run the air conditioner more uh, or just live with hotter temperatures more. So you really, there's a calculation. You can look it up and find the angle of the sun and choose what months you want to have some passive heating or whatnot. I didn't really do that. I designed the house that looks cool and I have some overhangs, pretty good overhangs. I have, so I have four foot overhangs in the front. I didn't want posts and supports. I just wanted basically the maximum overhangs we could build into the truss without getting too crazy that can still accommodate snow loads and everything like that. So my house is designed to block a lot of that sun so my house won't get heated by the sun for half the year, probably a little less than half the year, and then will get heated by the sun when I need it. So that was one design consideration which played into my property and where I positioned my house on the property. And that's a big consideration. It was one of the biggest considerations for me because it's gonna use less energy, it's gonna be more comfortable, and it's gonna be nicer. Uh, Ashley loves the sun. Uh, she would probably get sad, seasonal affective disorder without getting enough sun, and I might too. So we wanted to build a house that was both energy efficient, comfortable, uh, and also really nice to just be able to sit in the sun. Now obviously we'll have shades and blinds and we can close it when we want to. The other aspect of that is having super, super good insulation. So I designed the house to have pretty good insulation. I didn't go too crazy, honestly. It's a two by six framed house. Uh, I have I'm using exterior zip R, which is, this won't mean anything to the vast majority of you, but it's uh, basically exterior sheathing with a layer of foam built into it because then you have a continuous insulation around the whole house, and there's a thing called thermal bridging, this is gonna get a little nerdy, where like a two by six stud does not have nearly as much insulation as foam or bat or spray foam or anything. So basically the, the exterior temperature sucks through thermal bridges like a two by solid two by six and into your home. So even if you have R30 insulated walls in the bat, the two by six portion of the wall is not that, it's R2 or whatever. So I have paid a lot of attention to how I'm gonna insulate my home uh, in addition to the orientation and the windows and everything like that. In addition, I'm insulating the slab and I'm actually insulating the exterior wall of this giant uh, foundation wall. So my house is oriented on a hill. So on this side of my house is south and sun and level and flat and beautiful. My property, I wanted to situate it back in the trees a little bit and it kind of slopes down to the creek way down here. It's not a flood hazard, never will be a flood hazard unless uh, the great flood from Noah's time happens, then we'll all die. But this thing will never flood up to a point that is remotely gonna, you know, I remotely ever have to worry about. But it slopes down, which means uh, my house is basically a ranch and it has a walkout basement below. What that means is I have a massive amount of concrete in this wall right here. And that's gonna act as kind of a thermal battery. It's called thermal mass. And it's the same concept as a cooler or a refrigerator or whatever. The more thermal mass you have in there, if you open the door and then close it, you're your refrigerator hasn't really changed temperature much because there's so much in there that's just maintaining the temperature. Now if you have an empty thing and you open it for a little bit and you close it, the temperature inside has actually changed and the, the refrigerator has to work harder to cool it down. So that's really, you should fill your, if you wanna be a maximum efficiency, you should fill your fridge with water and just leave it in there because that has a lot of thermal mass to it and then it won't change in your, your air, your, compressor won't have to work as hard. Same concept with a house. Uh, again, try not to get too nerdy here, but basically I have a massive thermal battery that's gonna maintain an even temperature and it's gonna be very steady so my, the temperature in my house won't fluctuate a lot. Now, having a giant amount of thermal mass in and of itself doesn't really do anything for you because that will heat or cool. If it's cold outside, that's gonna transfer the heat right inside and you can't really take advantage of it. I have insulated exterior of it. So I have R15 insulation, four inches of rivet, rigid foam outside of my wall. So that means I am insulating my wall from whatever temperature is outside to help maintain the temperature inside. I'm doing that in the slab as well. I'm also running radiant PEX tubing, PEX tubing, and I'm gonna tie it into a 
I don't know yet. I haven't designed the whole system yet, but heat the slab and I'll have radiant heat in my basement. But again, I think my house is gonna be so warm, I'm not investing a ton of money or thought into that because I may never turn it on. I'm also gonna have a fireplace, so if you live in a cold climate and even if all your off-grid batteries and everything go out and there's extended power outage and your solar panels get fried by an EMP or whatever, you should still have a way to heat your home. So I am also gonna have a wood-burning fireplace placed in a place that will centrally, passively heat the whole home. So a lot of these design principles I've thought through functionally. And that's all I can really talk about because everyone's design tastes aesthetically or even how everything is situated and laid out is kind of their own personal opinion. So for me, I'll talk a little bit about the design of the home just because that's what this video is about. Uh, again, long, kind of narrow, and that is for the sun pretty much, uh, passive solar heating of the house. I designed basically a ranch. I designed pretty much everything that I wanted to be on the main level of the house. I didn't want to go up and down a lot of stairs. Maybe I'll live in this house forever, who knows? And if I do, if I'm aging in place or whatever, I don't want to go up and down stairs when I'm old. So I've designed the whole house to be a ranch style home basically. So the main bedrooms, kitchen, living room, actually even garage only has one step to get up into the house rather than a bunch of steps carrying groceries. I, I, when you're designing a custom house, you can think of all the things that you don't like in your past houses or past houses you've rented or houses you visited and you say, I don't like that, so I'm gonna change it. So I wanted to put everything on one level. I have a big open floor plan again, lots of windows and everything just lay out just works for me. I designed a little office. I don't like being in an office. Like I, I write a lot of emails and do a lot of stuff on a computer. I don't like to go into a room and be away from my family or anything like that. Granted, I do do that sometimes with calls and stuff. So I will have kind of an office gear. It's actually where I'm sitting right now. This will kind of be my gear room and office. I'm not gonna t talk too much about safe rooms or bunkers or whatever because I'm, I'm a private guy and maybe I've built them and maybe I haven't. Who knows? But as far as general usability, I have an office here and then I, I have, I like to be on my computer when I can still socialize and stuff. Yeah, it's very distracting, but if Ashley wants to talk to me after a long day, but I do need to write some emails or monitor something or print out some shipping labels or whatever I need to do, I can do that while still being kind of in a central location. So I designed a little kind of office nook that was a little bit out of the way, uh, but still like kind of in the main area. So there's little things like that, little features like that where it's a custom home, it's a one-off home that I wanted and you can do when you have a custom home. The other aspect, this kind of fits into property, uh, but also I, I could have built my house, I could have built my house right on near the road, like the main road that feeds my house. I could have built it right there and I'm kind of up on a hill. I could have built it just overlooking everyone. Rah, rah, just my nice house. I didn't, I built my house kind of set back. So you can't actually see my house from the road. So this is good from a security point of view. Nobody will be like, hey, I recognize that house from YouTube or whatever, because you can't see it. Uh, so that was important to me as well. And that's kind of a, a unicorn feature on a house that's still relatively close to town. Most houses you can see from a road. Mine you can't until you drive up my driveway, which will be gated. So I won't have any unwanted intruders, which means my dogs, if they're barking at something, I know that I should pay attention to that bark and it's just not a random person walking their dog by. Because anything that my house sees, if my dogs see it and they bark, that is gonna put me on alert. And this is kind of not paranoid, nothing like that. It's just a good thing to be able to do because I have these natural security systems built in. Granted, I'll have cameras and alarms and everything like that too because it's just what I do. But my dogs, for instance, where I live now, they bark all the time randomly and you kind of, it's kind of a uh, boy who cried wolf sort of. I don't really think anything of their barking because there's always people walking their dogs around and whatever. When you have your house kind of set away, if somebody's coming to your house and it's not the UPS driver, they shouldn't, they're not supposed to be there. And I don't even know how they would get there. So I like that personally because I don't really like people. I'm really, much, I'm really an introvert. Uh, but from a security point of view, that was important to me as well. And I didn't even really factor that in. Like when I was looking for a property, that wasn't one thing that I thought about. But when I was 
choosing where to put my house on this property, I was like, that is a really cool thing to be able to do and really important. So I, I should have added that to the property, like choosing a property, being able to build a house where nobody can see it. Because I don't, I don't care about what other people think about me. I'm not trying to show off my house or flex on anyone or anything like that. I just want a nice house to live in. Uh, and I don't care if nobody sees it. I actually prefer that nobody sees it. So orientation of the house is good for that as well. And then I'm not gonna talk too much on security aspects of the home, honestly. Uh, when you're building a custom home, can you put, put a safe room in it? Sure thing. Can you put a bunker in it? Sure thing. It's really weird and it's kind of tough uh, when it comes to permitting. Uh, so depending on where, and I should have talked about this in the location section, but that where you choose to build a house, you will be limited by that county and their permitting process and what they allow and how stringent they are. For instance, my house, uh, I'm in a higher fire danger zone. So my house, I'm, my house will never burn down. Knock on wood, knock on wood, wood's flammable. But, uh, I am required by my county, but more specifically by my local fire jurisdiction, the fire chief or the fire marshal or whoever has the ability to say, hey, your house needs a fire sprinkler. So my house needs a fire sprinkler in my home. So I'll have a 300 or 400 gallon tank of water, fire sprinklers, they're nice and recessed and you won't really notice them, but I have, my whole house will be a fire sprinkler. Uh, so any fires that happen in my house will be extinguished by the fire. I've actually done a lot of research. I wouldn't have put one in, honestly, but I was required to. And now I'm like, oh, it's a pretty cool thing actually to, to have. Granted, it's $20,000, uh, but I'm required to have it. In addition, I need a bunch of Class A fire rated stuff. My roof has to be impervious to fire. Uh, it's basically an under fire layman. I'm having a metal roof as well. My exterior siding is hardy. It's basically a cement board, very difficult to catch that on fire. Uh, I'm using class A fire rated decking material for my deck. That's an infused bamboo product I'll talk more about later. I've had to do a ton of fire mitigation. I actually have to cut down way more trees than I would ever want to cut down because there's a whole set of rules for fire mitigation. So I have to do all of that. Um, so I should have mentioned that actually in the earlier portion of the video. We have blizzards to worry about and we also have forest fires. It's actually the main one we have to worry about. But now my house will not burn down. It will be impossible for my house to burn down. If my house is burn if my house burns down, it deserved to have burned down. That fire was aggressive. Uh, so that uh, is also a kind of a house building design consideration. I, I would have chosen to build my house in an as fireproof way as possible, but that costs a lot more money. But now that I am required to by code, I am doing it and begrudgingly, but also kind of am happy with the end result of that as well. Uh, so fire escapes and stuff like that, security is what I was getting at. So am I gonna build a moat around my house? No, am I gonna build a bunch of bulletproof this and that? No, because I can't afford to. If I could have made all my windows bulletproof, if I was just like, insanely loaded or whatever. Yeah, I probably would have just because, but no, nah, I'm not doing any of that stuff. Uh, I live pretty realistically. And again, if somebody is coming here, I have the means and the training and the tools to defend myself from them. And I have all kinds of alarms and we'll have more alarms once everything's wired in. So I'm not too worried about the defense, defensibility of my home because I'll have that taken care of in different ways. So I'll talk more about my home. I'm gonna be doing updates on the build, probably like every couple of weeks, I'll give you an update and I'll talk through everything like home specific related. So if you just want a lot of detail on the build and the materials and how I've laid things out, I'll get to all that kind of in the build series. But I just kind of wanted to talk about general concepts of, of how I'm building the house. So I think that probably wraps up that section. So now let's talk about my experience so far. This is kind of a random topic, but I've gotten a lot of questions about the process. Uh, a lot of people have asked about my background, thinking that, oh, I'm building my own house. I certainly have some, some background in this. No, not really. Uh, I, again, I think I talked about it earlier in the video. I worked a couple summers as a construction guy, just basically uh, People tell me what to do and I did it. So I knew what was involved in a house. So the journey that led me here wasn't like I had a whole lot of experience or even a whole lot of desire to do it. What led me here was initially, 
I found the land that I wanted and then I designed the house that I wanted and then I actually took it to a builder and I took it to a modular home builder uh, here in Colorado. They've been in business for a long time, pretty reputable builder. And I don't really wanna talk negative about the builder because it was 2020, which was the Armageddon of building and everyone got hit because, you know, COVID or whatever. And there's supply shortages and worker shortages and factories shutting down and things were crazy. That was right when I decided to build a house. It is still a horrible time to build a house, but I'm a pretty stubborn guy, so I'm just moving through with it. But originally, I wasn't planning to build the home. I went to a home builder, and they were a modular home builder, and I took my design to them, and they're like, oh yeah, we can do basically everything in modular that you can do in a regular home. So we went through my design, like, yeah, we can do something like pretty much like that. And we got down the design process. I paid a big deposit. This is where I lost. I do your due diligence. So learn from my lessons. I lost about 20 grand with that builder because as I got further and further into it and further and further into the modular design, a lot of stuff they couldn't do. They couldn't do this span in modular. I wanted a big open. This is going to be like my great room in the basement and I'll have workout equipment and whatever and maybe a home theater and all kinds of stuff. I wanted a big great room in the basement. Uh, and they're like, we can't, well, we can do that, but you'll have to have a bunch of vertical supports in here because of how modular homes exist. I wanted big, huge windows and tall ceilings. And they said, oh, well, the max height we can really do is this on modular, but you could build it, you, you could do some of it yourself. And so basically I whittled down my design, which was more of my dream house design. Granted, if I won the lottery, I would have a different house than this, but we'll call it my dream house design. And we had to whittle it down into something that would work modular. And even with modular, it came to the point where all of this stuff that I wanted to do that didn't fit into the modular design, I'd have to build on site. I was gonna have to build the garage on site, the whole basement on site, a little entryway on site. And so I was going for this modular builder because I wanted to build a house fast, because I don't have patience. And this has certainly been a lesson in patience. So decided at this point, I was like, oh, and yeah, the final nail in the coffin was originally the timeline for modular. That was the main reason I went with it. They, they were gonna be, this was like, I think two Septembers ago, last, last September maybe. They're like, we can have the house done by September, last September, over a year ago. And I was like, sweet, awesome. And then when we kind of got down the process a little more, we didn't actually start doing anything yet. I think I had my well drilled at that point. We didn't actually start doing anything. And they're like, oh, sorry, like supply shortages. This is gonna be pushed back till May of next year. Like a whole, however many months that is, right? Seven, seven, eight, nine months, I don't know. Uh, they pushed it way back. And so I was at a crossroads and I was like, okay, do I wanna go forward, the primary reason I wanted to go with this builder and modular was because I wanted it fast. And now it's not even fast. And now it's not even the design that I wanted it to do. And at that point, all of the on-site stuff, I was like, I'm going to do the on-site. I'm going to build the on-site stuff. Like I'll have my hands in it. I've done this stuff before. I have a builder that'll do all the heavy lifting and I'll just be on-site hammering away, right? So I kind of had accepted the fact that I was going to do some of the work myself. And then this whole thing came together and I was like, you know what? Screw that. Screw you, home builder. Uh, I'm just gonna do it myself, which I don't know. I, I kind of probably regret that decision a little bit now that, I've, not, now that I'm into it and it's quite, it's a lot being a general contractor and actually the physical builder of your house so far has been a huge pain, especially in these last couple of years where everything is delayed, even the county is delayed, there's worker shortages, supply shortages, material costs is through the roof. This house costs way more to build now than it did like two or three years ago. And it's been an overall nightmare, but basically decided to cut ties. and was like, all right, I'm just gonna take on this whole project myself. Luckily, I have a friend, Jim, who used to be a builder, a uh, general contractor, and he has helped me with a few other projects and my parents with some projects and stuff. And I asked him, I was like, hey, would you help me build the house? Like I'll handle all of the paperwork and all of that crap and you just kind of help me build it. And he was like, yeah, sure. As long as I don't have to do any of the permitting, any of the stuff that sucks. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll, ha I'll handle all that. Uh, but being a general contractor, I found out, is basically following up with other contractors that suck or that lie to you or that 
don't return your calls or that commit to something and then they don't show up or that say they're going to do something and then they don't or that say, okay, we can do that in a month and it ends up being four months. And this is what I've had to deal with over and 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 over again. It's a full-time job just following up with people to do what I want them to do, which is wild because I personally, Jim and myself, and we have one other guy, Skylar, it's kind of a three-man crew that's gonna be building this whole thing. We're doing the vast majority of the work. So the contractors that I'm relying on, actually my plumber's pretty good, but the, the, the work that I'm relying on has been a nightmare. Uh, also just stuff takes long. Like for instance, I'm, I'm, as I'm framing this area of the house over here, it doesn't really matter, but I was planning to put in windows and for now while we're walking in and out, we didn't do the, the lower portion, the cripples and stuff. So now it's really just framed out to be big doors where the windows are. So it's got the header and just open. As we're walking in and out, I'm like, actually this is a pretty nice location for a door. So I have two bedrooms in the basement that I'm like, used to be windows. And now I'm like, oh, this would be sweet. I'm just gonna put some patio doors in here. No big deal, I already got it framed out. It's already engineered instead of a window. I just put in a door, sweet. Uh, I went to buy doors and then I, two months, two months out, which is, I'm going to do it anyway, but we're going to be done and past that. And we should have already had the doors in by then. So I got to figure out how to get these doors in later than they're supposed to be with the siding and all that stuff. So it's certainly been difficult and it's been a huge learning curve because again, I don't have any experience being a general contractor. Depending on where you live, you may not even be able to do it. You may have to use a licensed general contractor. A lot of the homeowner builds that you see on YouTube, they're out in the sticks. They're, they don't have super strict building codes or anything like that, and I think it's easier to do. Where I am in Jefferson County, Colorado, if you live in Colorado and you're a contractor of any sort, you'll probably be like, oh, Jefferson County, that sucks because it's well known. I think Boulder County is worse, but that's the only county that maybe is worse. Maybe isn't even worse. Jefferson County is one of the hardest counties to build in. It's very strict. Uh, and it's a weird county because even though I live in a rural location, Jefferson County spans into the city as well. So it's like half rural, half city. So it's kind of a unique county in that they have really strict codes that are enforced down in there. But I also have to adhere to those codes. But I also have additional codes being in the mountain, being in a high, like high danger wildfire area and all this other crap. So like I have to adhere to like strict city codes, but also stricter mountain codes. And it's just horrible. Uh, so I didn't know any of this stuff going into it. So a big portion of my battle has been with permitting, waiting for the county to reply to me, all of this stuff. Uh, building, now that I'm actually building, now that I'm actually literally building, uh, it's pretty good and things are going smooth. I really like to do things with my hands and now that I can build, it's great. But everything leading up to this, waiting for engineers, waiting for the county, waiting for this and waiting for that, it basically took a year to even be able to start doing anything, which is insane. I had no idea. And granted, if I was more experienced or skilled, well, not skilled, just more experienced and knew more about it, maybe I could have got it done quicker. But being a, a, a one-off home builder, it's also hard to find contractors. A lot of contractors work for builders, so they say, my cash cow is my builder and they keep me busy so i don't want to take off some take on some random joe schmo's custom house project where the owner is the general contractor he's probably going to be a pain to work with and he's never going to give me more business in the future because it's just a one-off house so it's kind of hard to even find work for some areas like concrete where most of the concrete contractors are super busy with other stuff and they're just like, eh, I'm not even gonna return your call or I'm gonna give you a quote, maybe come out, give you some false promises and then just kind of screw you over. That happens quite a bit as well. So there's been a lot of negativity and even though it's been literally the most frustrating experience of my life and I say that honestly, up to this point, the building of the home, which hasn't even really been building, like the building of the home isn't that frustrating, but the building 
designing and dealing with permitting and contractors and everything has been the most frustrating experience of my life. And I'm a pretty busy guy normally, like just my life is pretty busy. So taking this on on top of it was at times a huge regret. But on the positive side, it's also super rewarding. Like I, I chose to do this. I wasn't forced into it. I chose it. I could have found a different builder or a different general contractor or whatever. And I am saving some money because general contractor fees are, are quite high when, and they're not even doing any of the work. So I'm both doing some labor and also handling all the general contractor work. So I'm certainly saving some money, but I'm also working more than full time just building the house and being the general contractor because most general contractors don't even, don't, they don't swing a hammer. They're just dealing with everything, making sure it's good. And granted, a real general contractor, I'm sure does a way, way better job than I am doing, but it's tough. But again, sorry, to look on the bright side, it's been a great learning experience. I, I've, I know a ton now I've gained. If I went to build another house, even though this was the most frustrating experience of my life and I'm like, I'm never gonna do it again, now I know a lot more. So the process would probably go a lot smoother the second time, granted, I will need a lot, lot of time to cool down. Uh, after this, but you know what's involved in your house. So I've talked to the engineers about the structural design. I understand why my footer is the way it is. I understand the structural rebar that's going in here. I know the spans and the joists. I understand how all that works. The I, I knew some of this already from working in construction, but understand how my house is framed. I'm visually seeing where everything is going. Uh, I'm here with the plumber and we can make some game time decisions. I'm here framing it myself with my, with my crew and we can decide like right now, I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's turn those into doors. I think that'll be a sweeter living experience. And now I got an extra window. So let's plop an extra window in there. These are all things that you wouldn't really be able to do easily if you were kind of hands off. And then just the pride of, you know, having my son later and being like, I built this house, son. I think that would be really cool. So overall, the experience has been hugely eye-opening uh, and intellectually stimulating and physically and mentally exhausting. It's been super good overall as well. And that's the thing that I've found about building a house is all of the mumbo jumbo that you have to go through to get to where I am now and like physically building the house uh, it starts, all of that frustration kind of starts to fade away once you're actually physically seeing the progress and as you're making the pro progress physically yourself. You're like working and at the end of the day, you're like, oh, we hung those walls or did that or laid that sheeting. It's quite rewarding to do. So would I recommend that you do it? I don't, yeah, I don't, you couldn't do it if you had an, like a full-time job because this is more than a full-time job. So you you have to be a certain kind of person. So my full-time jobs, I guess, are like YouTube creation. So fortunately, I'm making this video, kind of this kind of, I'm integrating this into one of my jobs and then I run my holster company. But my holster company is flexible. I work on a lot of that stuff, the admin stuff and whatnot after hours. So I'm just working really, really long days that are exhausting and I'm just kind of, figuring out how to balance it all uh, because obviously I have family life that I have to balance as well. I think it'd be easier if I was just a single guy and I could commit my entire life to this. Not that that's what I want. I, I find my relationship and my wife actually hugely rewarding in the best, the best parts of my life. But if you do have a family and you do have other interests and hobbies, like my hobbies have taken a hit. I haven't mountain biked much. I haven't done a whole lot of anything other than doing a little truck stuff and camping and whatnot. So something is going to take a hit if you try and do it and you try and juggle more balls, basically. It, it becomes difficult. And that's something I think I'm having a little bit of a hard time with all of that. But it is a temporary thing and I can push through it. And luckily, Ashley is hugely supportive and understanding and is, is great. Uh, she's a great partner to have through this journey, but it's tough. It's tough. And this was kind of, I don't know what chapter of the, the video this is, but just kind of my experience as a general contractor uh, builder. 
So this video, hope you liked it. It was super, it was super random, but I felt like I needed to make a video just to kind of lay everything out. And if you're interested in this stuff, obviously get subscribed to the channel because I will be, I'm still gonna continue to do truck stuff and preparedness stuff and gear reviews and all that stuff. Like I is still gonna be the channel, but for the next handful of months, I am building this house and I will be doing building updates because I am fascinated by it, super excited about it. I think it's the one of the coolest things I've done physically uh, in a while. So I wanna share it with you guys and I think a lot of people would be interested in it. So we're gonna, we're gonna kinda go through the, the home, build, and then the end goal is not just to have a cool house that I really like, uh, but it's to build a homestead. So the content will continue further. Like once the home is built, this isn't turning into a home building channel by any means. There will be a season of home building and then that will shift a little bit to kind of homestead content. And Ashley will be much more a piece of that homestead content. So I don't know if we'll eventually evolve that homestead content into its own separate channel or put that on Ashley's channel or what, but probably, for, probably a lot of that will, will be here. Too. So if you're interested in homesteading, self-sufficiency, uh, just like building a house, I am not an expert. I will be sharing my journey with you, telling you what I've learned, telling you what I've failed at, and you'll see all of that. And I think it'd be super interesting for you to follow along if you're into any of that stuff. If you're not, if you're just into, if you're just into Tacomas or whatever, I'm still posting Tacoma videos. So don't unsubscribe. But I feel like if you're not interested, you wouldn't have watched this far anyway. Sorry, I'm kind of nasally, I'm kind of s stuffed up right now. I don't really know why. I think allergies and dirt and all this crap going on. But yeah, that is the journey. I don't know how long I talked. I feel like this video is gonna be a solid hour because it's getting late and I gotta get home to my family, get some dinner in my belly. But yeah, I would encourage you, I would really, really love I would love for you to leave some comments down below, uh, whether that's stuff you wanna see, whether that's advice, whether that's just, hey, I think this is cool, I'm stoked that you're filming it, or whatever. I like to hear from you guys, it's kind of motivating and nice to hear, but also it really helps me create content that you guys are interested in. Because I'm gonna make whatever videos I wanna make because this is my channel, honestly, but, if you tell me you are interested in something, then that's easier for me to incorporate because I probably would like to talk about whatever you're interested in. So let me know down below, as always. The build updates will continue. Quick, quick uh, build update, I guess. We'll be framing the main wall, the main exterior of the house. We might get started on it this week, but the plumber is basically doing all the underground work. Uh, it's He's calling for an inspection, I think, in two days. And once that's done, we're backfilling and leveling, and then it's a mad rush for me to get all the insulation in here, uh, radiant vapor barrier in, the wire mesh in, and then run all my PEX tubing, then I have to get that inspected, and then pouring concrete in less than a week. So we'll have a slab in here and the garage about a week from when I'm filming this video if everything goes as planned. So that'll be a big exciting step and then we'll be on to like raise the house. And Jim thinks within a month we'll have this place dried in. So we'll have it dried in before winter really sets in and it's coming together fast, I think. By the new year, I will nearly have a house to fit into, uh, to fit into, to move into. And that may just be just in time for baby. This baby's coming at the worst time. If he came like two months later, it'd be all good. He's coming at the worst time. But it's all good. Happy about that. So yeah, I should have also talked about it in the home building thing. So this is a custom one-off home. There's never been a home that is this. I didn't buy the floor plans or anything offline. I did, I didn't talk about it. I designed it. I did hire an engineer to kind of refine my basic drawing, make actual architectural drawings, and then you have to work with an engineer to engineer all of the spans and headers and everything. So I didn't do all of that. 
I just designed the layout, how it's gonna look, the shape, orientation, and then my architect took that. He tweaked a couple small things, but it's really pretty much what I designed. Uh, and then he did some renders for me, and then when I saw the renders, I made a couple other revisions, like let's move that and do all that. But uh, one of the things that you can do when you design your own house is, I designed everything to be as easy to build as possible. So my house isn't anything crazy to build and the reason I did that was because I knew that I was gonna be building it and I knew I wanted to build it quick. So I purposefully designed a house that would go up quick because I knew enough about construction to build that. And I also talked to my engineers and the architect and I said, hey, anytime you gotta make a decision for something, a, make it more affordable for me, but also B, make it easier for me to build. So everything was just as easy as it could be. So that's why I think this house from, from basically once we started framing to being done, it could be four to five months if things go smooth. So follow along with the journey, see if that happens, see if it doesn't. You don't have to hold me accountable because it don't matter because it's my house. But yeah, sweet. All right, guys, I know this video is uh, visually boring, but we'll change that in some upcoming videos. Thank you for watching. Thank you for hitting that thumbs up button, subscribing, commenting down below, all those things that you do on YouTube. I really appreciate it. And I am gonna try and relax now. And by relax, I mean go work on some holster stuff and edit this video and upload it. Cool. All right, guys, take care.